Hi, I'm Jesse Dillon. This is my co-host. Priscilla Cohen, and this is Jesse's Office. Today we're talking to experimental physicist Maria Sparopoulou, who worked at CERN's Large Halton Collider and was on the team that discovered the Higgs boson. We talked about matter versus antimatter, particle physics as art, and the text message that changed the history of science. But first, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, click like, watch this, and more episodes, or subscribe to Jesse's Office wherever you stream your podcast. Feel free to leave comments, reviews. We will try to respond whenever we can, and I hope you do leave comments. Yeah, lots of comments. We're okay with comments. Like, we want to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. Not the ugly, but the good and the bad. Did you ever go down in the mine? Not again. Well, right. I went back right. a few times since you, since we've been together. What is that neutrino experiment we're talking about? This is uh, the deep underground neutrino experiment, Dune. It's a huge 72,000 tons experiment that will be observing interactions of neutrinos with uh, liquid argon. And it is a first of its kind for scale, magnitude, and for the construction of the sensitive volume, what is the detector? Right. So this has never been done before. We have smaller scale experiments at Fermilab in order to test the technologies. They're called micro boon and different kinds of names, and they're preparing results of neutrinos. But the big scale one is the one that can detect neutrinos from supernova, so from the skies, observatory. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's like an ast astronomical observatory, you can call it like that. But also it observes handmade neutrinos. But what is so, a neutrino? So, but, well, neutrinos yeah. are... What, talk about the complication of measuring neutrinos yeah, because so they're the streaming out of the sun. why it's important. Yeah, and why it's important. So the, the neutrinos, everything we theorized about neutrinos forever was wrong. The first thing we knew about neutrinos are that they are zero mass particles and they are partners of the electron, the muon, and the tau, the leptons that we have in the standard model. We thought for the longest of the times that this would be zero mass. However, we found that they actually have tiny masses, but we didn't measure their masses directly. We inferred that they have masses because they oscillate to think about it, how to think about it. It's quantum mechanical oscillations. It's like one kind of neutrino and another kind of neutrino are changing as they move in space into the other part. The way we say it in physics is that the mass eigenstates and the flavor eigenstates are not the same. So a, a, a neutrino of a definite flavor does not have its own mass. So neutrinos are made of different kinds of masses. So one neutrino, neutrino one, let's say, is made of a little bit of electron, a little bit of muon, and a little bit of tau neutrino. And then when, you, when they propagate through material, through the earth, through space, they oscillate into each other. And th why is this important? This is important because it's quantum mechanical oscillation and mixing of the neutrinos might be the answer, might give us an answer if we measure it precisely of why we have a universe and not an anti-universe, or we have a universe and not pockets of anti-universes in there. Why the universe is matter dominated? Once we say, you remember Feynman said, it doesn't matter if we say plus or minus, right? We say matter and antimatter, we have it. We have measured matter and antimatter. But the universe is dominated by matter particles, not by antimatter what particles. What is anti-universe? Exactly. It would be a universe that was made of antimatter. Or Give me a metaphor that I can hold on to in my small brain. Antimatter we produce and antimatter is produced in various reactions. But all the universe, all the stable universe is made of matter. When matter and antimatter interact, they annihilate and energy comes out. The universe is made of matter, 
with the definition that we have of matter, made of electrons, not anti-electrons. We can produce anti-electrons, they are called positrons, and we study them and produce them. And they exist in bound states in various other configurations. But they, if, if, the, if there was an anti-universe, there would be an anti-Priscilla, and when you shake hand with the anti-Priscilla, energy would come out and there would be nothing left. So um, wait, so there's uh, nothing, so, so basically it's an invisible universe, or it's... It, it, you, you, our universe uh, made, the, uh, made uh, this uh, far-fetched thing, where we could make sci science fiction universe that it is anti-universe. And it doesn't matter what we call universe and anti-universe, the thing is, is that it's made of only one thing. It doesn't make, it's not made of both. So we don't have in our universe anti-galaxies, we have galaxies. So neutrinos are streaming out of the sun. They're everywhere. They, they, cloud our, in, they, they cloud our vision. We don't know what happens to them. They're sort of a mystery. So, they, so, you're, so you're building an experiment that starts in Chicago and then you, build, you beam neutrinos that you make South to, to South Dakota oh, been and then you've dug a mine you know, an old Wasn't it mine. a half mile down below? No, it was a mile. A mile. Yeah. A mile. Which the the we mine all is went. two miles. Yeah. The original mine is two miles, but the cavern is at the one mile deep underground level. Now, what was it like when you went there to see? Because we went there to we see went it. We went there. And, it was like, went, yeah. and we're walking by the old miners wait, wait, let's with just, the hold dust. On, let's just slip for the audience. We go to this obscure place in South Dakota, sort of, it felt like secret government thing, but it wasn't. We have to get in these special outfits and we get into an old elevator. This is the fearful team. <laughs> we get into an old elevator and we go really slow, slow. a mile down in an old hundred year old mining elevator. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're down there is so that we the, the, this experiment is not contaminated, correct? Well, it's the quietest place on earth, so, right? Exactly, so so is that it's not radiation contamination. You've got cosmic rays that are produced from protons and other particles. They hit the atmosphere and they create showers of particles. So the first particle physics we did was that, was cosmic rays, high energy cosmic rays. We, ha we know that there is places in the universe where the where particles are being accelerated and magnetic fields and so on and so forth they come to the earth they show on all the experiments that we have at the earth level so my experiment now at Caltech if I go and measure I will hear tick 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 and it will be cosmic rays and then I have a rate of these kind of events but I don't want these kind of events I don't want to have a lot of back, this kind of background. I want to have as little background as possible. And this is why I stick it down the earth, those huge neutrino experiments. So when you walked through the tunnel, the deep, dark tunnel that's mm. under there, I mean, mm. it feels like you're back in, you know, olden days. <laughs> and then you get to, there's a couple experiments already there. Mm, yes. And, and you come to a room that looks like you're in 2001. What did you... What did you think when you first experienced that? What was that like for you? Well, in this cavern, there was already an experiment uh, that had observed uh, the difference between what we expect from solar neutrinos and, and uh, what we see more than 50 years ago. And so the, that old cavern existed already. The new cavern that we are building, we are excavating, and so we're going 100 feet a day, det detonation, excavation of the, of the land of the, and the stone, this is granite and so on. And you go and do painstakingly in order to get the huge cavern that you will fit the detector in there. In the meantime, at CERN, we have built a huge but still not at that level experiment, which we call protodune prototype Dune, and we build it in collaboration with CERN. So you see, we keep, uh, we keep the exchanges, even though CERN is doing the Large Hadron Collider, we keep the exchanges on neutrino physics as well. How did you become interested in science? You know, like you're, you're in Greece, you're, you're, you know, what are you doing and how do you get interested in science? And then how do you, at what moment do you realize you're actually really, 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 really good at it? Right. So, you know, as I get older, the more I think about it, the more it's mysterious. 
some was it inevitable? I don't know. It seems to me inevitable now. Was it random? I don't know. I don't come from a science family at all. You wanted to be an astronaut, right? I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be a a fighter pilot and then end up in NASA. And Air Force was not taking uh, females. Oh, that bad mistake on their part. But there are females. uh, They've rectified it. Ever since then, of course, there are females that are are doing that. And I watched them because I was like, ah... But, uh, but I, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't lamenting the fact that I went to physics. Physics, I liked it a lot. I liked, I liked the humanities. I liked the arts. I wasn't very good in the arts, a little bit. I could understand it. I could feel it. But I wasn't good in producing it, mm-hmm. doing art. But I was very good in math and in physics and in doing experiments and taking things apart. What moment did you understand the standard model? Understand 12. it as I was, probably... I was 12 or 13. Yeah. And I was understanding the notion of the standard model because I was reading papers in Scientific American about beyond the standard model. I was, I was, I was reading about supersymmetry. Uh, between the ages of 12 and 14, I was obsessed with uh, what are these particles that are not the electrons and the quarks that we have measured. You know, I was, was doing nuts. that. I was doing that same thing, except it was with Led Zeppelin. You know well, what I mean? What is the standard <laughs> model? Right, the what standard the, model. The standard model, which is the standard theory. So the standard model is uh, is a remarkable, initially mathematical construct, but the models the physical reality across 24 orders of magnitude of the subatomic particles and their interactions. And the standard model of particle physics, uh, which was developed in the 60s, we didn't need to measure all the particles in order to formulate it. And then from the 60s to 2012, We had predictions and we were finding the particles with the last one and the most difficult and the most elusive being the Higgs boson. So what is the Large Hadron Collider? What does it do? What does it do? Right now it does nothing. Well, what, it, did it do? what did it do? <laughs> and you guys, so let me, nobody will, it will start doing. We, have, we are expecting to start in about a year and a half and we will have what we call run three, very coming after run two, run one. The Large Hadron Collider has been designed since 1980-something. In Lausanne, it was approved. And what is it? It's the extension of the Tevatron, which was the collider we had in Batavia, Illinois, which doesn't anymore exist. The Tevatron was colliding protons with antiprotons at an energy that arrived to 2 TV, close to 2 TV. And then... We have a jump of the energy in the Large Hadron Collider that goes to uh, 14 TV, 7 TV per beam, and we're not colliding particles and antiparticles, protons and antiprotons. We are colliding protons with protons. Good question is why. Yeah. It's because to make antiparticles and keep them in and keep them at these energies is very difficult. Antiparticles are not in their natural form, right? You have to manufacture them, Mm -hmm. and then you have to tend to them carefully so that they don't annihilate with particles. We did the Tevatron particles with antiparticles because in order to get to the Higgs at low energy, the processes that we needed were particle with antiparticle. For the LHC, in order to get to the Higgs and supersymmetry at those high energies, Good enough to have particles with particles. In the end, it's the gluons that collide at these high energies. Mm-hmm. So it's the glue that keeps the quarks. Yes, you have. We have still quark quark and uh, and interactions that are of this type. But in the end, it's the glue. It's the energy. Well, I feel that like she's so, speaking in different languages. So, I am not. So did you? So do you remember the I'm first wonderful. time you you went there? You went and and you actually went down in the tunnel. And what was that like? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I I went many many times and I was and I wanted to be going there because it was uh, I was getting there the lecture you know in my head. Right. Why are we doing this and how yes. the scale and the magnitude and how many people are working there? Even when there were the technicians and engineers and everyone and students and yeah. uh, 
and uh, figuring out that we don't have leaks of water in the underground caverns. Yes, I was going there. I went there. Because how uh, big is it? It's 18 miles around, yeah? Yeah, it's 27 kilometers around. So from the four um, miles, we went to 18 miles. Did you ever go around the whole loop underground? At CERN, I, no, I have done the Tevatron on the whole loop. At CERN, I'm not even sure that one can go the whole loop around. Right. There are all the extraction beams, right. the, the other beam lines. So I haven't on the underground. On the top, I have gone from different access points. I have gone down to the tunnel. You know, so when you first turn it on, there's, it, it you know, the, does it go so well, correct? I was there. No, it went very good for the first 10 days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was there taking the data. It was really quite quite good. And then, um, and then, you know, like 10 things went wrong. A transformer blew up and then we replaced it very fast and something else went wrong and something else went wrong. So we went for the first uh, 10 days. It was okay. And then uh, September 18. Uh, 2008, uh, we blew it. What happened is, is that there was uh, some sort of an implosion and the helium that we have to keep the magnets cold, that is that went around, it caused a huge explosion and it blew the magnets apart in the place that it happened. But is like an explosion explosion or is it... Yeah. An, an Im- yeah, an implosion yeah, like it, explosion. Like it, like it took it offline for a year. Yeah, it took okay. it offline and we have to rebuild it. And uh, it was good that no nobody, nobody was, was there okay. because it was yeah. cold. I mean, liquid helium, it was cold down there. It was like... Um, then you get past that and um, you have to revalidate all the physics and that takes like two years. And what's that process? Nine months. Nine months. We did it in nine months so with is- half of the beam. Right. In nine months, we validated a hundred years of particle physics. So how do you go about doing that? You know, is it like, let's start at the smallest unit and work our way up? The way you do it is now you know the physics because you have discovered it at the Tevatron right and left. So you know what you want, what you expect to see. You design the, the, the fishnet appropriately, we call it trigger, to fish the events that would give you the W boson, the Z boson, the top quark, the taus, the J psi's, the various particles that we have discovered for for a hundred that you, we kept discovering for a hundred years. So when we have the beams, we're just designing how to fish all of these processes, all of these phenomena. Yeah. Because we know it. What we didn't know is where's the eggs. Essentially, the the collider is a camera. It's taking pictures, like millions of pictures of giant pictures. So I I imagine each one of these photographs has all of the stuff already in it, except how do you look for it? How do you look for it and see if it's all in there? What's that process like? Uh, Imagine your camera, for example, has a filter and only keeps the red color from all these pictures, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. I know what is red. I will put a filter there and I will keep only mm-hmm. red. Right. I know what is blue. I will keep only blue. So for us, I know what is the top, what is the W, what is the Z, what is the J psi. I will I put all these filters right. and they run. And then I take the data out of the filters and I sort them in a, ve- a very painstaking, you know, each one of these events, what we call events, You've got 100 million channels, electronic channels. You're going to see how many of them fired. You're going to reconstruct the event, which means of all the tens of the detectors you have, you take the channels that fired. You don't take the noise. You don't take the pedestal and the noise. If something fired, you take it, then you have to take all the other all the other hits that fired all the other detectors within the time of these collisions timing is very important mm-hmm. and they come every 25 nanoseconds so they are not coming like <laughs> so so Wait, yeah that's really every right. 25 nanoseconds 25 nanoseconds that's we've a lot got of seconds so there's essentially the, the the collider is four cameras and if you find something you got to call the person at the other place and see if they saw it too, correct? Yes, there's so t- two yeah. general cameras, the general purpose physics, so Atlas and CMS. The other two cameras are a little different. The one operates when we have ion collisions, when we try and do understand the plasma 
particle plasma and connects again with uh, but, astrophysics. But Atlas and CMS. But are, Atlas and CMS. They're they're different constructions because they have to see different. They have to see the same thing in different ways. Thank correct? you. This is very good. We call them dual in some sense, right? right? So one has a bigger magnet, one has a smaller magnet. One is a bigger detector in volume. One is more dense and smaller in volume. But if you work out the details of the performance for watching the Higgs here and watching the Higgs there, the performance has to be such that they both watch Higgs because you can't have Higgs here and not Higgs there. So after nine months, you rebuild all of physics for the rest of us. Yes. We, we appreciate that. Yes, because thank you. Appreciate that. We did that. Now, it, does there come a day where you decide, now we're going to look for it, we're going to look for the Higgs? And how do you know, basically, there is a thing that you don't know? Like, who says there's something called the Higgs, but we've never found it, and who, why is it called Higgs? Yeah. So there is, uh, there's three Higgs, th three Higgs notions. There's the human Higgs, Mr. Peter Higgs, who got a Nobel Prize for the Higgs. And what was the Higgs that he got a Nobel Prize for? It was uh, the Higgs particle, which is teased out as a vibration of the Higgs field, like every, every the way we talk about particles in particle physics, we talk about fields. There is a field, there is the electron field. And then if you tickle it, electrons come out. The particle version of the field. <laughs> you tickle the particle? You tickle the field, the particle comes Very out. Very cool. Okay. okay. But hold what? on, because let's just stick with this one part about the Higgs, right? You're, yes. So you you decide on one day you're going to look for the Higgs. Well, we, we've, been, we've been looking for the Higgs at the Tevatron forever as well. It's just that we couldn't do the tickling. With the energy we had, it wasn't enough. There was a, a few Higgs produced, but it was very little. It right. Was, so at the LHC, it was like vroom, right. a lot of large Higgs hadron there. collider. For anyone who didn't know what that meant, right? Yeah. Large hadron collider. So what is the Higgs? It's a very old thing that so, that we think, you know, everything else comes out of. So describe it. So the Higgs provides the Higgs construct, the mathematically and the physics, the theory of it provides the symmetry breaking mechanism, and I will explain that because it sounds like uh, it sounds like. Uh, alien language, the symmetry breaking mechanism that when it happens, I go from, I go from symmetry to less symmetry. And in this, in this uh, transition, it's a quantum criticality phenomenon, in this transition happens mass. So before, when I am in a symmetrical universe, from the point of view of the interactions and the forces, no particle has mass. So what is this kind of universe? This is the universe that we don't know what it is. We haven't measured it, right? But we expected that there would be something which is called electroweak phase transition, where there is symmetry breaking, and I go from a massless universe to a massive universe through the Higgs mechanism, which is the symmetry breaking. Now, what kind of other symmetry breakings we have? The best examples of symmetry breakings are in solids, in crystals, in magnetic materials, where if all the spins are aligned in magnetic materials, it has one property. If, you, if it becomes disordered, it has another property. In one, it exhibits magnetism. In the other, it doesn't exhibit magnetism. And there's different kinds of translational symmetry in crystals that create, when they break, when the symmetry breaks, it creates phonons. You can study all of that in crystals. People have been studying this for centuries, in, well, for a long time in solids. But we never studied that in the quantum vacuum because that's the Higgs and because it's difficult. So the Higgs is the equivalent of symmetry breakings that we understand, where when something goes from a, a, a very symmetric to a less symmetric place, a phenomenon occurs, whether it is a particle, a spin wave, a, a phenomenon occurs. So it's, it's a, without these kind of uh, critical phenomena, the, you, a supersymmetric, a, a symmetric, and let's not confuse it with supersymmetry, but a, 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 a symmetric universe where we didn't have the quantum transition, mm -hmm. we didn't have the symmetry breaking, it would be a boring non-universe. It would be nothing. Well, is this so, like the Big Bang? I mean, so, that no, no, no. Good question. The Big Bang is, we don't know what it is. Okay. So 
Right. But but what staying on the Higgs. Let's we are okay. staying on the Higgs. Staying on the Higgs. In a simple way, it's like thinking that you have a puzzle that's all together and then when you put it through the collider, it breaks down into all its component pieces. And that's really never been observed before except Correct. in this thing. Correct. So you go about starting to revalidate these pieces. At one moment, and obviously it's a big success, right? But there is a moment where you and maybe three or four people are the only people on the earth that know about this. Yes. And and twelve people in that case. Can you? There's a picture can you, of that. Can you <laughs> take? Well, you you weren't actually there. Was, you were somewhere else. I was. In, but can you? Take, I was in the cold harbor, teaching oncologists how we do background. <laughs> <laughs> in particle physics so that they can figure out in their research how we think, how particle so, physics think. So you're at, you're at CERN, you say, June. listen, I got to go and uh, you guys do some work <laughs> over here. You know, Take us through the story of what had happened and what that was like. Right. It was 12 June and it was uh, 10 o'clock in the morning at the Cold Harbor Laboratories there. And so one of my postdocs at CERN uh, starts typing on Skype chatting with me and it says, it's there. Mm -hmm. It was, so my heart was losing beats. There was not, because, and also I was very, I was very nervous because I wanted to see from the numbers, is it enough signal over background so that we can say Eureka. And then he went from one channel to another channel. He was telling me the numbers and I said, I want the plot. Right. Did you do the mass fit? What is the mass? So we had this exchange, and the, and the time for my talk was coming. So I said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't give this. You have to reschedule me yeah. somehow a little later because I have to tell you this. We have the Higgs. The, the, this experiment, thousands of people worked on it. You, yeah. you led one of the teams of these two teams. And, and uh, uh, what did it feel like? I mean, it's like that says the center of, of our understanding of what the – the standard model is, and you're, you know, you can go all the way back to, you know, past Einstein to, to think about this. You're a part of history. Like, what did you, what did you and your team think about at that moment? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, the team, the especially what I call the kids, the ones that they're between the ages of, of because we had even some undergraduates were were working. They were not there in the room, but the the 22 year olds. And all the way to postdocs, thirty year olds. Uh, I think there was no en the enjoyment came yeah. much later, yeah. right? So you have the focus now that it's almost like you're saving lives, yeah. and it's fight or flight. Yeah. We have to prepare the slides. The slides go to me. From me, they go to the spokesperson. From the spokesperson to the director of CERN. Comparisons are happening, and and. Uh, the paper is being written. So at each level, we have uh, everyone had, had had to keep the focus. I think even the director was, maybe the director had a moment at that time that uh, that felt enthusiastic. But the, sp the spokespeople of the experiment from for CMS was Joey Candela um, from Santa Barbara and from Atlas, it was Fabiola Gianotti, who is now the director general and a good friend of mine. And she, even the spokespeople were very, very focused and calm um, because you you still have to, you have to be sure, yeah. right? You yeah. can't sure. say to the world, I discovered the Higgs and then take it back. And in high energy physics, the culture is such that you don't do oops, yeah. Mistake because it's a hundred right. years of, of producing it. It's what you said: the validation, the validation, the validation. Yeah. There's no oopsie. Yeah. <laughs> There's no. But you wait, know, wait, wait, wait. Once it's discovered and you've seen it and you've captured it, is it? Can you put that away and move on, or are you still looking for it? In other words, once you've been able to uh, define or art how to find it. Can yeah. you go back and find it again and again? We are going back and we're still going back and find it again and again in yeah. different kinds of final states. We didn't discover it in all its possibilities that yes. can be discovered. So you, it also, you know, it the predictions had it having certain characteristics of which it had most of those, but yes, it also it had, had other things that were mysterious and will take so, another 20 or 30 years of physics to figure out. 
Yeah, know. we still the curveball is still there. It's ma- the mass is a is a huge mystery. In fact, in the seventies, Pulitzer from Caltech and Wolfram, Wolfram or Wolfram, they had written a paper that in this kind of uh, symmetry breaking field uh, and mechanism, uh, you can be in an unstable minimum. And then you can quantum tunnel and the entire universe will bubble away and appear in a different minimum with a different kind of, of um, uh, vacuum energy, let's, let's say. So the Higgs at the moment, because we only know it's... We, know, we measure the mass and we measure the couplings with the other particles, how it gives them mass. We have not measured how it couples to itself, how it generates mass for itself. Mm. You have to think okay. of the Higgs also when I say symmetry breaking. It's male and female. It's self-propelled, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So this is self-propelled and it's okay, it touches everyone else and assigns yeah. mass to oh, everybody else. But it touches itself to produce mass for itself mm. and it has a big mass, 125. It's a big, right. huge mass that it has. So the 125 number in, I mean, we, when, we, when the theorists are making the theory, the 125 number is not there in the theory. Mm-hmm. This is like a latent parameter of the model. Could be 114, 115, 120, 170, etc. And people are writing papers. If it is that, then that. If it is that, then that. And the problem with 125 is, is that it's very difficult to figure out with 125 how to make the quantum corrections to the mass of the Higgs fit so that all the puzzle is together. And it's hard to say that supersymmetry is going to give you this answer for this particular mass of the Higgs. So now you're in no man's land and you can't say this isn't the Higgs because you measured it and you keep measuring it in one and the other. But the curveball is there. How are we going to figure out what is going on with this mass? So, you know, Feynman said we're up against mysteries. Yeah, it's and a mystery. We, how do you think about science when you're just sitting around and you're thinking about these particles and you're thinking about these components and these pieces? And, you know, how do you think? How do you visualize it in your mind? You said at the beginning, "Well, I wasn't, I didn't, wasn't able to do the arts." But isn't this like the most art that we have in society? You know, what I mean, besides Beethoven, isn't particle physics actually the most artistic thing we as a species actually we, do? I, thank you for saying that. I really, I really think so. Uh, I think the the way our all particle physics is the way our brains work and the way we conceptualize things in terms of designing new experiments because it's the mysteries that we want to solve. We kind of cover so much space of what can we possibly build and how we can possibly catch the shot in the dark. Mm-hmm. And so I do think that with with machine learning and AI, if we put together, imagine that, if you put together all the knowledge of all the experiments right now, the incompatibilities, some of the results that they're incompatible, you can spot them. And maybe you can, you can have the, the, the compilation of all knowledge machine-wise give you a better design of an experiment faster. We yeah. come to that, right? In one century, we came to designs that they're ingenious. But imagine if with machine, with machine learning, with all these new methodologies that we have, because we have the data and the knowledge and the computing power, it is possible that we can design a priori the experiments and not to... You see, we can design, an exp- we can have an experimental design a priori that it is optimized um, in a much better way than we can... So artistically do it with our neurons looking at things like you know kips you know gravity you know and you know some of the things we see you know deep in the universe with different experiments and you know you have all these different things going on and yes. how do they is how do they interrelate is that what you Yes right. we can do that we can right. interrelate after the standard model of particle physics, we build the standard model of the, 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 the model, the standard model of cosmology. Now these two are interrelated because when we're talking about, you mentioned Big Bang, the, when we're talking about the dynamics of the universe, how it create, it's created, 
how it behaves in the scales that we see in particle physics and how it's going to evolve, you could put all the data together mm. and the puzzles are actually just bre- teasing out all the puzzles and mysteries that we have and already. It's getting bigger. Like puzzles. Alma, for yes, exactly. Alma, This the two days ago I saw on the, some results from this observatory in Chile, the set of observatories yeah. in Chile, and they found galaxies old galaxies that are close to how old the universe is. Well, that doesn't fit well with the standard model of cosmology that we have with large-scale structure, etc. So puzzles in terms of uh, particle physics and cosmology, persisting puzzles, uh, the connection of the Higgs with dark matter, what is dark matter? Is it a particle or is it some quantum thing? What is dark energy? What is the the universe filled with this uh, with this ambient energy? And as you said, expanding, Priscilla, expanding in an accelerated form. But you know, we have been observing this for a hundred years. Maybe it will contract. Maybe it will do something else. I mean, the the reason why the Big Bang is a picture became a picture is because when you observe the universe expanding, it's a very appealing thing to do. A back pollation and say, well, if it's expanding, then it started from here. Right. <laughs> right. It's a right. Very, uh, is that our need to understand? And also, why is it called the God particle? Oh, yes. Uh, is that because, f- because Leon Letterman wrote a book that was called The God Damn Particle, and his editor <laughs> didn't like it. Uh, the God Damn Particle? The God Damn Particle. <laughs> yeah. And his editor said, he said, the headline editor says, I'm not publishing the God yeah. and Particle yeah. book. Oh, you mean because it was you. so frustrating and hard to find, not that there. it was... It was so hard to find. So, and, then, and then the editor said, we can call it the God Particle, and it will include the notion... <laughs> uh, Leon, that it is a goddamn particle, but you know it's uh, everybody believes in it. Problems for us. So know, so like, so they yeah. call it. Go- everybody believes in it. Nobody yeah. has seen it up to yeah. then, and uh, and uh, it creates all other particles. So yeah, yeah it's um, so it, so artificial intelligence. Usually, when we when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about semantic search engines, like doing very, you know selling you stuff or you know not very uh, so substantial not not so when you're saying science and artificial intelligence what are you talking about so the scientific method you know Francis Bacon said you do an experiment you have a theory you test if the if the data is uh, is showing you what you theorized then it's good, and if it doesn't, it doesn't matter how beautiful the theorist is and how brilliant, etc. You junk the theory and you start from scratch. Well, that was up to now, up to 21st century. 21st century, we have arrived at immense computation power, and it's a looper if you think about it, because where does the computation power come from? It comes from simple things like the transistors, that are based on quantum mechanics, right. switches that you can then do zeros and ones and compute. Computer engines are created by physics. Without computer engines now, they have become extremely powerful. And without them, how are we doing physics, science, any, any science eventually that has data? Right. Now, the 21st century is the end of Moore's law where we are, we, achieve, we are in the apotheosis of computing power. You cannot put more transistors in a chip. But now you have tons of data, scientific data. You have data, you can produce data in the number of emails and tweets and do other stuff and do, your, and do the, the advertisement that mm-hmm. you th- say. But the data, the scientific data we have is the most useful data because for the sciences that we understand, we have a theory we have the labeled data because we have a theory. For the science that we don't have a theory, we do data-driven, but they have tons of data. Imagine biogenetics, imagine all the people who are um, translating, the, the mapping the genome for every human being. Sure. This is, this is, this is uh, Googles of data. The, the biggest data that I know so far that is useful data, it comes from particle physics because we were at a petabyte per second. We are being, mm-hmm. our input is that, and now it will be 50 petabytes per second. So when we did that, when we started taking data to the LHC, we have our own networks, our own uh, 
pipes to, to send the data our own computing engines, we, we would have broken the internet if we tried to so, do that. So now with all this data and all this compute power, you can put in, um, you can put at work algorithms that people developed in the 70s that try to do clever computations as the brain, because the brain is the biggest computer of all and with the lowest power, right? So they used, a, uh, that's why they're called neural networks, right? So now you've got the algorithms also and the algorithms learn from the data. This is not a very... This is not a very foreign thing. This is like the babies mm -hmm. on the neurons. They learn from the experience, the touch, the reinf they reinforce their knowledge from their environment. And now you can start and do hot houses of learning, right? So you learn very fast because you've got a lot of data. Right. So total hot house, hot house, and you prepare results based on learning from the data. And it's and then, more data than a human being can analyze. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and it's more even than uh, a machine without the algorithms would be able to compute, mm -hmm. you know, so with the, what, the old way of computation. So AI for us in science is to accelerate the discovery and also to give us new insights, big scale simulations, the hardware, the software, the data and the algorithms is a new ecosystem. All of it together. Mm. I'm not separating it. And it's part of the scientific method. Um, what is going to happen when you turn a quantum computer on? Because it doesn't exactly, it's not just that it's faster, it's that it thinks very differently than our computers. So what do you hope happens with a quantum computer? Right, so when the quantum computer turns on and the idea where why... Feynman and uh, Deutsch and others were thinking of the quantum computer a long time ago. This is because the universe is quantum in its core. So if you really want to know the universe uh, precisely, then only with a quantum, only with a system that is quantum, you can know everything of the universe. You cannot know everything of black holes without a quantum system. But we don't know the physics of black holes. People, people struggle with the physics of black holes, up to where it is quantum, up to where it is uh, gravity, general relativity, if you'd fall in, if you come out, but spaghettification, movies, etc. But we really don't know. We do have a beautiful so, photograph of a black hole. We do. We do have a beautiful photograph of the black hole from the from all the data of all the telescopes, and it was as of recent that we have that, and it's quite uh, quite impressive. Yes. What does the world look like with quantum computing? How is it going to change? Yeah, world? we don't know. I mean, the quantum quantum computing aspirationally is, as just said, we're going to run. So we're done with Moore's law. We cannot put more transistors on a chip, we're going to make, um, we're going to make computing that can be done at its basis in parallel threads, not just GPUs that we have in parallel, we have parallel computing with GPUs, but at its beginning and essence, because of quantum superposition, we can have paths that are, that are in parallel being solved very fast. From the, from the very beginning, right? So you can do compute very fast like that. And then you have a very peculiar phenomenon um, of, uh, of quantum physics, which is quantum entanglement. And the two of them can make powerful, secure, faster computation uh, if we can build these machines at scale. Maybe we will build smaller machines of qubits and and network them and and still kind of reap the the benefit uh, but at the moment we don't know what is a quantum computer at the moment if we have an architecture so you know for the normal computers we know it's silicon right sure for uh, for the quantum computer will it be atoms 
that you will put in some place and then compute on the atoms? Will it be ions? Will it be superconducting little circuits? The, all of these have, the qubit has these two states. And, and then this is why it can encode a lot of information because it's not zero and it's not one, it's everything in between. And, uh, and so all of these physical systems can, be, can do computation, but how large, how big, you know, how many thousand atoms do you need or how many millions qubits do you need in order to do the computations? And which architecture do you have? Do you take the ions? Do you take the atoms? Do you take the superconducting qubits? We have many physical systems. So this is why when we talk about quantum computers today, we talk about physics experiments and then we talk about systems integration and then we talk about scaling and all of these need not just physicists because it's a physics experiment but applied physicists theoretical physicists mathematicians applied mathematicians how the compute will work um uh, uh, engineers, quantum engineers. We didn't have quantum engineers. When I went to grad school, we didn't have quantum device, a class that is quantum devices. Now, if you go to every university, there's a quantum engineering track and there's quantum devices classes. But how does this change the world? Like, how does the world look differently? This is the kind of question that, you know, 50 years ago, there was this book that was written um, with essays from all the people at MIT at the the people who were doing computers yeah. and uh, the visionaries of the future and the people who were imagining that you could sit on your laptop and have all the information at the tip of your finger and do your tax returns and talk to everyone in the world. And uh, they put this essay, they put this uh, set of essays, especially for computing, most of it was right on. But then they didn't ask how is this going to change the world? Yeah. Am I going to be hacked every time and have, yeah. you know... You've got to think of unintended consequences. But why? Because they didn't make a round table with the social scientists, with yeah. the philosophers, yeah. with the historians, with yeah. the artists. Yeah. You can't... And in fact, there is, a, there is a historian at Harvard and she wrote a little article in the New Yorker a few months ago that was impressive because when they asked, she goes through the detail of what was in the book, and then when they asked the mathematicians and the physicists and the engineers, so how is this going to impact? And I said, oh, I don't know. We'll see. That, yeah. <laughs> right. Right, so this is something that one needs to sit down and, and think More through. More anxiety, I would, I would say, is at the top wow. of the list. We can't say, but, but it would be good, it would be good to, to not do it post facto to not sure. think the you know because because right now yeah. the unintended consequences are hitting us 50 years later and and we we take everything for granted that it should be the way it is today yeah. so are you optimistic for the future of science it's going to be um Yes, I'm very optimistic. It's going to be fantastical. It's going to be better than science fiction mm. and weirder. And weirder? Yeah. <laughs> well, it already is. Great. Well, thank you, Maria, so much for coming in. Thank this you. was great. You have to come back. There's I'll come back, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that was great. great. Thank mm. you for your questions. The validation question, Jesse, you know, I will put you, <laughs> I will put you in the review committees because yeah. this is the question always that we have to be careful about science. Validation and verification again yeah. and again yeah. and again. Well, you know, you deal with that in the social sciences too. Well, we also... Where, you, where it's ambiguous and you can never get a... Yeah. You know, the, the uh, microscope is Twitter. You know, the co we <laughs> well, have the collider the called Twitter. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's good luck. Yeah, it puts a lot of information out, but, you know, you can't separate signal from noise, you know. Yeah, I mean? no, and and, uh, and, the, and the more network it is, there's more noise because yeah. you have all this all these unintended consequences from having bots and yeah. automated yeah. systems, yeah, and exactly. they inject so much noise, so the pipes are now well, yeah. mostly noise yeah. and very little useful knowledge. Well, that's exactly yeah, well, right, that's and that's a metaphor for what's going on socially. Yeah, oh. it is, it is. Great. Thank you, Maria. All right. Yay. And watch yeah. Thanks, guys. You're amazing. Thanks for watching or listening. Don't forget to subscribe. Click here for the next episode and respond. We, we really want to hear from you.